Welcome to the survey class. Survey the Epistle to the Romans. This is a study that um, has progressed from being fairly casual and superficial to being a bit more detailed. We are now in chapter 6 of the book of Romans and we are on verses 3 through 5. I'm hoping that by the end of the evening, you will be able to look at these verses, 3, 4, and 5, and say, oh my goodness, I understand these, and they are so clear, I know what the Apostle Paul is saying. And so having said that, would you open your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 6. I was talking to one of my uh, fellow graduates from Prairie and one of the um, treatises that we had to write was on the book of Romans. And everybody just did not look forward to that. We dreaded it. Our teacher, despite the fact that his heart was in the right place, uh, Professor Ellie Maxwell, he just confused us more and more because he had this idea that you don't necessarily have to be dogmatic about what the Bible says. So it became a little, I don't know, a little funny. And so I was talking to one of my fellow graduates and he said he was so scared because everybody knows that when you get into your senior year, you have to write this treatise and so he said he started writing it right from the very beginning every time it was a class he'd write a little bit more into his paper by the time we got to chapter 8 which was the end of our study he had finished his paper on that same day and then he said that he waited a couple of days before he turned it in because he didn't want to get jumped on so I think the rest of us, we waited until the very last minute, yeah. tried to cram, tried to do whatever. And uh, so let's see whether we can throw some light on chapter 6 of the book of Romans. Let me begin to read at verse 1 because this is where we begin. And verses 1 and 2 actually are like the can opener. They are what start the conversation. And the topic of conversation is announced in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be, verse 2. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And that's the end of his declaration. Beginning at verse 3 and following, he amplifies on his answer. So verse 3 says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. A lot of words, and I'm hoping that we can unpack this and that we can shed enough light onto this that it'll make it a little bit easier to comprehend. So, the first few slides that I'm going to show you are review. We've reviewed them several times. A comparison between water baptism and spirit baptism. And we noted the first and foremost distinction between the two is that in water baptism, the person gets wet. In spirit baptism, the person doesn't get wet. The person gets, shall we say, spirited. A spirit is infused into him. You've seen this uh, image several times, so I won't go through it again. You'll notice that there are uh, several 
uh, points of comparison. Uh, in water baptism, we are talking about something which is symbolic. We are also talking about the fact that water baptism is a ritual. With spirit baptism, we take note of the fact that this is a transaction that takes place in heaven. It doesn't take place here on earth. We also take note of the fact that this is when you are incorporated, that is, you were brought together into uh, Christ, that will be your position. Also, we have taken note of the fact that this is when you were made into a spiritual creature. Now, all humans have some kind of ethereal or spiritual component, but this is a special spiritual creature that you have become. And it's kind of like it's the difference between donkeys and horses. They both have four legs, they both can whinny, uh, they both uh, can get used to human beings, but a horse is an elegant animal. It uh, can walk, it can run, it can trot, it can prance, it can do a number of things. Whereas with a donkey, you're lucky if you can get that thing to go when you want it to go. And that is the difference between a believer in Christ from the Old Testament and a believer in Christ of the New Testament. We have been given a far greater ability and flexibility to do things that others could not do. And our fourth point of comparison is that in spirit baptism, you have the unity that brings people together. We say it's one, there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Passages of scripture for water baptism and spirit baptism are on the screen. We've gone through these a couple of times before, so we won't do it again now. <clears throat> Once again, passages of scripture for water baptism. We had the passage for the mandate, that is the command uh, for baptism. We have the documentation. We have uh, a situation where a woman was baptized. And uh, this is because in Christ there is neither male nor female. And uh, a water baptism is one of those things which does not isolate a woman. We note that a doctrinal introduction always preceded the ritual of baptism. In other words, you don't get baptized just like that. You have to have some um, teaching so that you know what you're doing. We also noted that uh, the most carnal of the ancient uh, believers were the Corinthians, and they got baptized. And then we also took note of the fact that this ritual of water baptism creates divisions among, among believers. Spirit baptism. Uh, six points uh, that uh, we have gone over uh, first of all, you're incorporated into one body, and that is the body of Christ. Um, you uh, are involved in something which is brand new, never seen before in the Old Testament, and never uh, actually made to walk until uh, Pentecost. Then we came to Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, and, and the the uh, title that I assign to this is Identified with Christ. And then you'll notice that in, par in parentheses I have the words too general. In other words, this is a good title for this passage, but it's not specific enough. It does not give us enough details for us to be able to appreciate what that means. We also uh, have noted that uh, Spirit baptism means that you clothe yourself with Christ, that you have his righteousness, that being in Christ, you have been elevated beyond the level of angels. And once again, this is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. 
So we want to take a look at that number three, that portion where we find identified with Christ and that that is way too general. And so if your Bibles are still open, maybe we can make them go. Verse 3, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? So let's take the phrase that is highlighted in yellow. Do you not know? Now I know that there's an or in front of it. Uh, and if you read the context, you see that uh, that or helps to color that phrase. Do you not know? And so we know that this is a question. And so I want to, I want to bring to your awareness that this question is not just rhetorical. A rhetorical question is a question that you're not requiring the audience to answer. It is a question that you are making so that the person will ask the question to himself and come to some kind of a logical conclusion. Well, that's just the plain Jane variety of rhetorical questions. This rhetorical question is also censorious. And a censorious rhetorical question is one which pokes fun at the person who's being asked the question. And so in this situation, instead of, or do you not know, it could be translated, you should know, or by now you should know. You should know this already. And so this is a question, but it's censorious because it pokes, it prods, and it stimulates the hearer to say, if I don't know this, I've got to find out. Paul is obligating his readership to conclude that the content of this discourse is basic doctrine and that it forms the basis for a doctrinal superstructure of spiritual growth. And that spiritual growth is what determines a Christian lifestyle. So if you're just a young Christian, you don't know very much about the Bible, then you're only held accountable for what you know. But the more that you're exposed, the more you are held responsible. And that is what the Apostle Paul is doing here. He says, or do you not know? You should know by now put spurs to the horse so that you get to know a little faster. The object that is to be known in this case is our identity in Christ. When you use the verb know, it always tells you directly or indirectly what it is that you know. So if somebody says, do you know Bill? And you say, yeah, I know. It means that you know Bill, because that's the context. You cannot just say, I know, without having somewhere in your mind an object that is known. No matter what it is, there's an object in your thinking of what it is to be known. In this case, the object to be known is the identity that we sustain in Christ. And in this case, it's more specific. It is our being baptized in Christ and that that baptism includes being identified with Christ's death. So, we know what baptism means. We've already talked about it many times. It means to be identified. But in this case, it goes beyond I'm identified with Christ. I'm identified with Christ's death. So, that is a very, very profound subject. 
And that is what the Apostle Paul is ringing his bell about. Okay, let's go to the next phrase. Or do you not know that all of us, and here I've highlighted the, the little phrase, all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. Now I bring this up because this is a passage that teaches that the state of all church age believers is being in Christ. Every person, no matter who that person is, no matter what his ethnicity, no matter what her economic stature is, or what her parentage is, it, who, when you believe in Christ, you are in Christ. You are, that is your status. <clears throat> your status is what gives you your privileges. And this passage here, all of us tell us that all believers have equal privileges. So, number two, being identified with Christ's death is not a higher level of Christian experience. It is not a higher level of Christian experience. And I'm going to give you two examples of how churches have identified being uh, how being in Christ uh, is supposed to be a higher level of of Christian experience. The first of these, the first of these examples is what is known as the second blessing. The second blessing. So let me go back to the slide and see whether you can tell what that is. See, there are some congregations that they don't feel that they are worshiping unless the Holy Spirit descends onto the audience among the chairs and the Holy Spirit visits each and every person. And when you are visited by the Holy Spirit, you want to stand up, you want to yell, you want to hold up your hands because you are experiencing the second blessing. Okay. So, first sub-point under the second blessing. Most Pentecostal and Charismatic people believe that the baptism with the Holy Spirit is a second blessing. That is, one that's received in addition to salvation. So you get saved on a Sunday, and maybe you'll get the second blessing the next Sunday after you fasted and prayed or done whatever. <clears throat> One of the people that was very instrumental in uh, my coming to faith, his name is Gilbert Endo, uh, Japanese boy, uh, he, um, he dragged me out to a Billy Graham revival meeting. And uh, that's how I became more and more aware about my lost condition. Well, after um, I became saved, he and I were very good friends. We became excellent friends. And when we graduated from high school, he went to a charismatic college, and I did not. At that charismatic college, when they found out that he had not received the second blessing, they took him down to the basement, and they did not allow him to eat or sleep for two or three days because he had not received that second blessing. Later on he told me he had to fake it because he's just a roly-poly guy he just couldn't go too many days without eating. <laughs> Number two, they believe that you can be saved and be indwelt by Christ. But that's not all, that God has 
for you and for me. So you can be saved, you can have indwelling of God, but that's not enough. Number three, you must go on to receive power. And it's in heavy letters because this is the telling mark. You must go on to receive power, gifts, and an overflow. And uh, I don't want to necessarily define these three items in much detail, but power means that you pray and God answers your prayer. And uh, you may be praying for $10 so you can play at the arcade, and God answers your prayer, and your prayer is answered in quarters so you can put it into the machines. It's power. Gifts, that means that you will receive spiritual gifts. Sometimes those gifts are um, tongues. Sometimes those gifts are gifts of healing, gifts of wisdom, different kinds of gifts. And then the overflow means that when you go to church, that you feel the Holy Spirit just scintillating down your body and uh, you cannot hold yourself back. Ecstatics. So, number three, once again, you must go on from salvation to receive power and gifts and an overflow. To them, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the so-called second blessing. This means that it is entirely possible to be saved, but to lack everything that goes with salvation. Number five. People say, and I'm just quoting the general person, I prayed for the second blessing of the baptism and had an incredible experience. Unquote. Well, maybe you did. But this does not mean that what happened to you was the second blessing. Rather, it was God honoring your faith and bringing you into a place where you can trust the teaching of his word more. There are a lot of people who say, you know, I became a Christian and in less than a week I I was just completely swallowed up with joy, etc., etc., and I had a wonderful, voracious appetite for his word. This is God honoring your faith. Number six, according to Pentecostals, the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. This last little phrase, as the Spirit gives utterance, is because if you put them on the spot and say, okay, speak in tongues, say, well, the Holy Spirit didn't move me. <laughs> so that means they can't do it and they're just they can't, They can't do it on command, right? <laughs> but they can do it when nobody's watching. Oh, jeez. It's like one of my friends, he did his best Skiing when nobody was with him. Yeah. Did his best fishing when nobody was with him. Nobody's going to believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven. The Assemblies of God website states, and I'm quoting from their website, all believers are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, notice, Holy Spirit and fire. According to the commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to challenge you to look up in the Bible and see whether you can find that command. Not, not Just, fire. 
I challenge you to look it up. This was the normal experience of all in the early church, close quotes. They further teach that, quote, this experience is distinct and subsequent to the experience of the new birth, close quotes. It's the second blessing. That is what we're talking about here in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Okay, so let's go over the, our points once again. Uh, number one, this passage of Scripture teaches that the state of all church age believers is being in Christ. That is, all of them. And that's because the verse says, all of us. And it doesn't say, will be baptized, but has been baptized. See? Number two, being identified with Christ's death is not a higher level of Christian experience. First example, second blessing. Second example, it is known as the stigmata. The stigmata. Ivan Illich, born uh, 4 September 1926, died 2 December 2002, was a Croatian-Austrian philosopher, Roman Catholic priest, and critic of the institution of modern Western culture. He um, is famous for a treatise that is known as Deschooling Society. And uh, in his mind, he figured that having schools is detrimental to humans because that's where they learn that there are some that are more apt to learn than others and that they make discrimination and that the whole fabric of human relationships is disruptive because knowledge has been added into the mix. And so if we could only get away from schools and get away from knowledge, we could be one happy family. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. So, so, what's his point then? Well, that is his point. Let's get rid of schools. In his paper, entitled Hospitality and Pain, Christian theologian Ivan Illich states, quote, compassion with Christ. Now this word compassion means having empathy with, feeling the same thing with. So you have co and passion, the two things. Compassion with Christ is faith which is so strong and so deeply incarnate that it leads to the individual embodiment of the contemplated pain. His thesis is that stigmata result from exceptional poignancy of religious faith and desire to associate oneself with the suffering Messiah. And so he is saying, if you are really faithful, and you appreciate Jesus that much, then when you think of his suffering, you suffer as well. It's kind of like my wife is pregnant and I have sympathetic cramps. Right? And so the husband really isn't pregnant. He's not, he is just going through some empty things. And so they, this is what he is saying. So, a stigma is a mark on the skin. I've got some pictures here. And you will notice that uh, there are people in each of these uh, photographs uh, that have marks on their skin. The lady all the way on the left side of the skin, and you can probably read what the thing says there. Uh, her brow bleeds because... She's thinking of the crown of thorns on Jesus' head. 
Because of this, she is holier than you and I are because she's right in there with Jesus. In the second picture, you have a priest. And you notice he's holding up his hands, both of them. They have nail prints. Blood. In the two pictures way on the right, you have somebody who has a cross that has appeared on his forehead. And it's bloody. In the bottom picture, you have another priest. And you'll notice that this person is almost bathed in blood. There's blood everywhere. That's called the stigmata. Stigma is one. They say that there's basically five wounds that Christ sustained. Right? Two hands, two feet, and a lance on the side. Makes five. That's stigma is singular. Stigmata is plural. Stigmata are primarily associated with Roman Catholicism. Many reported stigmatics are members of Catholic religious orders. In other words, they're monks or nuns. A high percentage, perhaps over 80, of all stigmatics are women. Number five. These are wounds that are or were inflicted on Jesus during his crucifixion. Wounds in the wrists, the feet from the nails, and on the side from the lance. Some stigmatics display wounds on the forehead similar to those caused by the crown of thorns. Okay, almost always Catholic dogma says five Holy wounds. Right? Lance on the side. Oh, well, what about the crown of thorns? Got to make room for that. Others reported uh, forms that include tears of blood or sweating blood or wounds to the back as from scourging, that is from whipping. So now we've gone to beyond five. Okay, do you find this among Baptists? No, not usually. You certainly never find it among Confucius, uh, Buddhists, Muslims, um, Presbyterians, Methodists, but you do find them primarily amongst the Catholics. And the vast majority, according to this, about 80% are women. All right, that's the stigmata. All right, let's go back to verse 3. And this time I've highlighted the last long phrase of the verse. Been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. What you see here is like a, like a formula or like an equation. If you're baptized into Christ, you're automatically baptized into his death. So that is what you have. All right, go ahead. restored to the state of, that God originally created us, we have to be baptized in Christ's death. That's the only way you can get rid 
Okay. The, Good observation. Is that, is that, okay. Good observation. That's the logic that we're following here. I just want to make sure I'm following the right logic here. All right. My so brain. our first point, to be baptized into Christ is to be baptized into Christ's death. You can't say you're baptized into Christ, but not baptized into his death. Buy one, get one. Okay. And so that is what we see so far in this part of verse 3. Secondly, this is a reverse picture of water baptism. In water baptism, going into the water is where and when you indicate your identification with Christ. Water baptism is a ritual. It is something that is acted out and the public is able to witness it. That's why there are some churches that say, you know, it's a public testimony. That's what it is. And, of course, uh, we have countless of uh, missionary accounts that when people get baptized, it often breaks up their family. Uh, the family will consider them to be dead. They'll have funerals for them and everything. But that's the ritual. We're not talking about the spirit baptism. So this is a reverse picture of water baptism. Baptism into Christ is not a ritual, but a real identification with Christ. As a result, a real identification with his death. Okay, we know what it means to be identified with Christ. I've shown you that diagram, the cross and the two circles. Top circle is what I am in Christ. But what are you in his death? That's what we want to examine, because if you'll notice, this verse is very specific. All of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. You know that, don't you? Yes. See, that's the verse. You should know this by now. Verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him, through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And we took off on verse 4 because of the phrase newness of life. But I want to take us back a little bit more so that we can actually just sit down and read this chapter and see how the Apostle Paul is progressing step by step. Verse Four begins with the word therefore. Okay, therefore what? Well, didn't we just talk about the logic in verse 3? And the logic in verse 3 is we're not just identified with Christ, we're also identified with his death. And so I ask you the question, what does that mean? What does that look like? The Apostle Paul comes and he says, Therefore, because we are identified with his death, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. But let's slow the horses down a little bit more. This verse begins with the word therefore. It's the Greek word un. Un. This is one of those strange words that we always wonder how they came up with this word. And I don't know, you can think of maybe a bunch of Greeks sitting around in a cave and they're turning over their gyros or something like that. And, and then somebody comes up with, uh, why don't you do this? And the guy says, un, because of this. And instead of saying yes or wait a minute, he says, un. Hardly opens his mouth. Okay. This verse begins with the word therefore, which is the Greek word un. And notice it's omicron, upsilon, 
a diphthong, it has a circumflex accent, and it has a soft breathing mark combined in that first diphthong, followed by a consonant, the letter nu. Number two. This word is referred to as a particle. This word is referred to as a particle or a primary word, and it is used to indicate the action of a thought blossoming into a linked thought. So this word is interesting because it allows you to think of what a thought might be and how that thought begins to blossom into something else. And then that other thought pictures in your mind and it is linked to the first thought. And that's what the word un means. Therefore, one thought blossoms, have the full blossom thought over here, but the full blossom thought links back to the first thought. Un. It's translated usually with the word certainly or the word accordingly. And accordingly is a word, I mean, immediately rang my bell. I liked it. But the word accordingly is too vague. And the word accordingly can mean and so or truly or it can be translated but now or can be translated so then. So let's just try one of these. Certainly we have been buried with him. So if we use the first one. Accordingly we have been buried with him. And so we have been buried with him. Truly we have been buried with him. But now we have been buried with him. So then we have been buried with him. Okay, let me ask you, and you can look in your Bibles, open book test. What is the primary thought in verse 3? We're identifying with his death. Okay. And we've got to be buried, too. <laughs> I mean. Okay, see... In the ancient world, that's, that's the way that they disposed of bodies. Now, true, they would um, incinerate some, particularly the Greeks, you know, the Trojans. But the Jews, <laughs> they would never think of that. What they would think of, we got to put this body someplace, let's bury the body. Do you bury a live body or a dead one? So, if you're dead, in verse 3, then certainly we have been buried with him. See? Mm -hmm. Or accordingly we have been buried with him. And so we have been buried with him. The Apostle Paul is taking that thought and he's pushing you, pushing you into coming to this conclusion. We're dead, therefore we're buried. And then he's going to take it one step further. Let's see how much time I got. He's going to take it one step further. If we're buried with him, then God, who raised up Jesus from the dead, is going to raise us also, and we can walk in newness of life. Can you see what he's doing? I mean, the Apostle Paul is devilish. Because he just takes your thought and he tweaks it and tweaks it so that you get it. Now, in our English, you can read this a hundred times and you probably wouldn't come up with it. You have to take it a little bit at a time. And knowing the original language is very, very helpful. Okay, so this verse, number one, begins with un. Secondly, this is a word which is used to indicate the action of a thought blossoming or we can even say evolving into another thought however still linked to the original okay 
So, in verse 3, there's the dead. And the thought blossoms into verse 4, the dead get buried. We just went through that little exercise. Do you bury a live person? No, no unless you want to torture somebody. The usual practice is you die first, you get buried second. Reminds me of that song that was sung, I think, by... Uh, Frank Sinatra, love and marriage, love and marriage. goes together like a horse and carriage. carriage. Mm -hmm. And you put the horse in front, not the carriage. Mm -hmm. That's the same way that you have this. Dead and buried are linked as a progression of thought. Okay. Verse 4, therefore, we just talked about the therefore, now we come to, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. And I think I made that yellow stripe a little too long. But let's see if we can talk our way through this. Therefore, we have been buried with him. Why? Because we're dead. But it goes on to say, through baptism, baptism into death. What baptism is that? Is it water baptism? No, there's no water in this passage at all. What the Apostle Paul is saying is that God the Holy Spirit through his baptism has identified us with the death of Christ. See, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Okay? We ask that question, a logical question. Do you bury a live person? No. Dead first, buried second. In this case, look. You are buried first, and then you go into death. It's exactly opposite. See? Okay. Our first point, we are familiar with the diagram of the cross in two circles. Guys already know that. So let's begin with the cross. The cross represents retroactive positional truth. What's retroactive mean? It means that something happened in the past, you weren't there, but you are given credit for that. It's like, for instance, I think that the uh, minimum wage in Washington has now been raised to what, 1450? Mm -hmm. 11 and a half. Went to 11 and a half? Wasn't State it 11 and a half before? Statewide, but Seattle's 15. Well, let's just leave it at 11 and a half. What was it before? Like nine. Nine or seven? Yeah. Okay, so if they were going to pay you retroactively, in the year 2020, you would get paid retroactively from the year 2019. So there's going to be roughly $4 or so that they owe you per hour. And so you'd say, well, I'm getting paid retroactively. And that's because the law takes effect before well, in this particular case, what takes effect is that Christ died in my place 2,000 years ago. Now, this is very, very important because later on, in verses 5 and 6, it's going to say that <clears throat> we are like this in the likeness of his death. We didn't die but in the likeness of his death, we are identified. That's retroactive positional truth. Okay. So we're familiar with this diagram. So the first part of the diagram is the cross. And that is that 2,000 years ago, Christ died in my place, retroactive positional truth. Next comes current positional truth. That is, this is what is true of me today. 
And that began the instant that you were placed in Christ. So somewhere in the past, and let me show with my cursor, you believe that Christ died in your place and your faith was immediately imputed with righteousness, right? And Abraham believed and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. That righteousness is this top circle. And that instant you were placed in Christ. That is your current position. So I'll put the circle up there and I'll put the uh, various points and I know you've got this stuff already. Next comes experiential positional truth. And experiential positional truth is the fact that you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do God's will. That empowerment is represented by the bottom circle. So let me put up the bottom circle. Okay, and you're empowered, for instance, to have private worship or public worship, to pray, to give, um, all of those things. So we have developed already the two circles in pretty much good detail. But we don't know about the cross. And it's this retroactive positional truth that we are studying about in verses 3, 4, and 5 of the book of Romans. So the way that we can approach this is by asking, what happened at the cross? What was so important of what happened at the cross? So, let's see what we've got. We're familiar with the cross in two circles. We ask the question, what happened at the cross? And uh, it's really not a very fair question. Um, so we can maybe ask it a different way. What did the cross accomplish? The question isn't really fair, because as humans, we can't understand or appreciate the magnitude of the act of Christ on the cross. We can visualize that he was crucified. We can go to a movie like Mel Gibson's The Passion. We can see the suffering that he would have to endure. But we cannot appreciate the value of what he did. The main thing for us is to consider what the benefits are that accrue to us because of his work on the cross. So what are the benefits that come to us because of what he did? So, let's check them out. First of all, Christ gave us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How do we know? Well, there's a couple passages of scripture, and uh, Mark 1.8 is one, John chapter 1, verse 33 is the other. So first of all, let's begin with this very important point. Because oftentimes we talk about, well, baptized with the Holy Spirit. What's that mean? Well, let's take a look. Mark chapter 1 and verse 8. And I know I'm close, but... Okay, in verse 8, it says, John the Baptist is speaking, I baptize you with water. Okay, we understand that. Ritual baptism. I baptize you with water. But he, speaking of Christ, will, future tense, baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that Jesus Christ is going to introduce us to the ministries of the Holy Spirit. So that today, the church-age believer, 
more than any other person in the economy of God has the Holy Spirit. We have got power steering, power brakes, power windows. We got power everything. Whereas those poor people in the Old Testament, they were in carts with wooden wheels. We are so far advanced over all of those. And how did that happen? Because Jesus Christ baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. In other words, he introduces us to him. Jesus had this long talk with his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed. He says, the Comforter will come. When the Comforter comes, he will teach you all things and lead you uh, into the knowledge of everything that I have taught you. So, Christ is the one who gave us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That means that we are associated with him. Now, there are some fundamentalists who make a distinction in the word of. Some will say, are you baptized of the Holy Spirit? Are you baptized with the Holy Spirit? And it depends as to who you talk to as to which side they're going to take at the time. I want to look at it this way. And that is that in this case, John the Baptist testified, recorded in Scripture, that Jesus Christ is going to identify you and me with the Holy Spirit. Now would you turn to John chapter 1. Okay, let me begin to uh, read this. This is a scene that is plucked right out of the time uh, of the baptism of Jesus Christ in water, a ritual baptism. And John the Baptist is uh, giving a certain statement concerning that. So let me begin to read at verse 32. John, as John the Baptist was testifying, in other words, he's giving a statement I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. And the idea here is that the, the dove identified Jesus as the Messiah. I did not recognize him uh, at first, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, quote, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And so here's the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is giving us this particular baptism of the Holy Spirit. Verse 34, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So in these two passages of Scripture, we have the man that has been credited with the highest accolade. Uh, the Lord Jesus said of John the Baptist, there is no man born of woman who is of the same grade or the same quality as this one. And he says, I am giving you my statement. This is the Son of God. Okay, so we see that Christ is the one who gave us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Number two, this is the Holy Spirit's operation in which he, God the Holy Spirit, identifies us with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Spirit baptism is when now the Holy Spirit is doing the baptism. It's not Christ that's doing the baptism. That's point number one. This is now point number two. Christ uh, is not doing that baptism. 
It's the Holy Spirit that's doing that baptism. And he identifies us with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the LJC stands for. He is the one who places us in Christ, puts us into that top circle. And then thirdly, he makes us accepted in the beloved. The beloved is a very small circle of friends. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We have been allowed to enter into this exclusive uh, country club in which we are now beloved. We are beloved because God loves the Son with a perfect love and He loves you with a perfect love. Number three, this is that transaction that takes place in the third heaven. This is where the throne room of God is. I don't know. We've got, we've re actually run out of time. So let me see if I can make this point a little bit more vivid. You know that the tabernacle is the pattern of the way that heaven is set up. And you know that the action of the high priest is to bring sweet smelling savor to God and to bring the blood of the offering that actually brings about the forgiveness of sins and all those things. Okay. In heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ, while he was on the cross, somehow, we don't know, but somehow he made that transaction so that the Holy Spirit can now elevate us, take away our sins, puts us in a favorable position with God. That happened when Christ was on the cross. We have not the faintest idea what he did or how he did it. The cross for the second three hours was covered in darkness. We don't know. And that is the transaction that took place in the third heaven. That he brought us into contact with the Holy Spirit. Number four. Baptized into Christ is the same thing as being baptized into his death. What was his death? That's when he was separated from God on the cross. How many times did Christ die on the cross? He died twice. So there's more in there than meets the eye. We'll talk about that a little later. Number five. Therefore, we have been buried with him through... And the word here could really be via baptism into death, or both deaths. So, the baptism of the Holy Spirit somehow has identified us with the death of Christ. We don't know. This double death is the, is the kind from which only the glory of the Father can raise. In other words, once you have this death, there's no way that that can be reversed, but only the glory of the Father. What does glory mean? It means his omnipotence, his sovereignty, his righteousness, and his justice. And with that, we're going to have to close because we are very, very deep in theology.